He was just so positive and warm and inviting and hilarious. Um, and it just, you know, it was just never a dull moment. It was unlike anybody I'd ever met before, genuinely. I, I just thought, who is, who is this guy? You know, <laughs> what, what, what universe has he been? <laughs> has he flown in from? Everyone wanted to be around him. You know, you go, where's Nat? And then he'd <laughs> go like, everyone, boom. And then you'd have like 100 people around him and he'd be like, oh, let's have it. First time I met your dad, I thought uh, I thought um, I, I wasn't too keen on him at all. Really, I thought he's what, what a Larry bastard in that. Uh. <laughs> we, th I thought, who's this flash fucker? Very, very, very like early twenties, you know, when I met him, and it was around at Justin's house at Rembrandt Road, which was the HQ for the very first studio that we had. And he was like a, a, a Larry, eighteen-year-old North Londoner coming down to the south of London, and 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 the the mad energy for parties was, was incredible. Back in back in the day, before Wiggle really kind of came into being, um, Nathan's thing, which I think was the most extraordinary thing, was was Heart and Soul. And there was quite a few of us that were involved in Heart and Soul. It was really exciting getting your ticket, you know. Yeah, I got, got my ticket. It was it was quite a thing. And the great thing about Heart and Soul was the age demographic was amazing. You had teenagers right up to 50, 60 year olds all, all in together. And it was a really mad mixture of sort of like young, young people, people like myself were in their sort of like, in their sort of mid to late twenties. But you also had all these old hippies there as well. And it was just, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was brilliant. And then politics got in the way with heart and soul. And your dad was like, right, <laughs> right, I'm going to start another party. <laughs> and there you go, Wiggle was born. Until My friend Tovey, who is down in, um, her, her dad used to come to Wiggle when we first started up. He's a bit of a hippie and he never used to wear any shoes. Just used just to wear bare feet and he'd like be in the toilet and that. <laughs> Just, um, just, a, just a character. He used to, he used to sort of like take um, a mannequin doll down to the pub and have a drink with a mannequin doll. <laughs> but he used to call his uh, his daughter Toby, his little Wiggles. And we said, oh, what well, we said, well, we don't think of a name. What do you think of a name for a thing? She went, oh, what about Wiggles? My little Wiggles, my dad used to call me. And we were just like, yeah, Wiggle, that's just totally unpretentious. It's not like, there's loads of pretentious names going around, you know, like uh, scientific names, you know, um, whatever, you know, and, um, I thought, yeah, Wiggle was really unpretentious. It's just a fun, a fun name. So it's, uh, that's what we want to be. That's what that's the part we want to do. The first one, I don't know if it was a, a, a garage or a, a, um, an MOT place in North London. I just remember going in there thinking, my God, it stunk of grease. It was not, <laughs> um, and that was completely illegal. That first one. And he, he was, we have been the police turned up. No, we, um, we you know, can't be selling drinks to people. Selling drinks, and Nathan was, Nathan was saying, "No, no, we're not. We're not selling the drinks. We're selling the ice, and uh, the, the drinks are free. So you, you can't you can't get done for selling ice, can you? You've seen it somewhere on some program or something." <laughs> and uh, we totally got away with it. Though. And uh, they we go, oh, "Come in, come in, have a drink with us. Come in, you know." Um, me and Nathan outside, and I let Nathan do most of the talking because he was like, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> "It definitely felt really fresh." The music felt fresh. I mean, the way it was being played. Um, I mean, it, it was like something really new that people were kind of mixing together these two quite incompatible worlds of, of house and techno, you know? And it was like, well, we can actually put these two things together. It was a perfect distillation of sound, light, crowd. There was something quite, nothing's perfect, but there was something almost perfect about it. it it was musically the night was programmed so beautifully it was a vibe and it was they knew what they were getting and they looked forward to it and it was almost like going and and seeing family you know it was it was like a 500 piece family <laughs> 
and everyone knew that they was going to be able to dance their socks off. Woogle in some ways wasn't very frivolous in, in, in the sense that it wasn't a glamorous club, you know, it was all about the music, it was all about the sweat, it was all about the dirty warehouses and all that sort of thing. People weren't afraid to play vocals, people weren't afraid to play techno. And it just went all over the place, breaking some of the chains. It was very open minded music being on, which is reflected in the crowd as well, which was also really fun for us. We got, it was just, it wasn't, it was an unconscious, it was just very natural because Nathan was naturally drawn to so many people and, and it was well, it was so many people that I mean, and we kind of got to know them and it was very non judgmental towards people. Um, and there was, you know, a healthy mixture of all walks of life, you know. Um, and that wasn't always the case, you know, when I first started going out, it was you know, sometimes quite heterogeneous. Um, and I, for one, with my, <laughs> with my background, um, didn't always fit in, but I, I definitely didn't even think twice about it when I went to it. And you, you knew you were safe in there. It was always safe. Always. Except in Stoke Newington when we thought the floor was going to collapse. And then the music was thumping that much. And, and the, the room with the dance floor was, was upstairs and the whole floor was bouncing. The chandelier downstairs in the ballroom downstairs was bouncing up and down like about a foot. When I eventually caught up with Nat, I was like, Nat, this floor's really bouncing. And he was like, are you sure it's not a sprung floor? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man, I think you're gonna be all right. And, um, we, we we just went up and politely asked people because like, some people were going fucking mental, and so it was just like, can you can you just chat a little bit? Like, <laughs> I mean, the most crazy venues you put parties on in. I mean, that's that's the thing that always struck me is that you know, a scout hut in Camden or a, or a fucking doll office here, or it was just like, what? <laughs> it's mental. When Wiggle started, we were already kind of like a production team. You know, Housey Doings had already kind of like had had sort of come into being. And it was just, and we made um, we made a, a, a track called Brothers as our first track. The brothers gonna work it out. It has, it has actually. I've heard it been said that it was actually credited as the first ever tech house tune. Um, brothers, um, I, I, I don't know, that's up to other people to say that, I don't know, I've never said that. <laughs> and we just had uh, an 8-track and, and uh, a sequencer and a drum machine, and then we bought a sampler, and then we bought a 101, and then we bought a Juno, and we were all sort of learning together. It, it was like a little boys club, and we'd get together, and it, we usually on a, a Thursday or something, so it was just before the weekend, and, and we have recovered from the last weekend. I mean, Justin called, did, said it was like a boys club, a gentleman's club, you know what I mean? And it was, I think it was a bit more, <laughs> it was a bit more silly than that. It was like, it was like a silly sausage club, you know? We, 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 we were serious about making the tunes, but we couldn't have done it if it wasn't fun and it wasn't a laugh, you know, and we'd smoke quite a bit of weed and we'd be, we'd be like laughing. Like, I, honestly, I, I've never seen like laughter like that. You know, I, I, I remember Nathan falling around the floor. He, was, he couldn't breathe, he was laughing so much. And then the manager, Andy of Strange Weather Studios, he managed all the little studio unit. He brought this weed into the studio and I've never been so stoned in my entire life. And we were, we were like, we didn't know what we were doing. We were like looking at the instruments going, how does that work? I forgot, I've forgotten how Cubase works. And it was like, honestly, it was like disastrous. But somehow or another, through all the laughing and the joking, we we managed to put tunes together. You no, know, he he was full steam ahead. He wanted, you know, you know, he, he could, you know, put the brakes on the the, the silliness and, and and be straight into that kind of work hyper focus work mode as well. You know, he wanted to get on the keyboards. He wanted to be set up to, to try and write the next lines on the next sound. He wanted me to plug the microphone in so he could record his voice. He'd sit, sit down and write, you know, get, get some lyrics in his head and bounce them off me and whatever it might be. He'd like to inject a bit of himself into the mix in that way as well, you know? I mean, pogoing is a word that came to mind. He, he, he would be pogoing around the studio a lot of the time. We, we, when we were in the studio, it was just having a laugh, you know? It was just like being friendly and you know, you know, 
just having banter with each other, you know, and like, you know, talking to each other and saying to each other, oh, what are you thinking? Because it made it more funnier, do you know what I mean? And so we started to get to know the names, the tracks. That's why we called a lot of the names of the tracks in which way they were, do you know what I mean? It was just so much fun. I mean, I think we'd met after two or three weeks and we said, yeah, let's get to see you together, let's, let's do something. And we just we just was laying down ideas one after the other, not really stopping. And you know, probably by the end of the, the evening, we we done system error. Like we just had a laugh. It was just constant. You know, it was like we'd be making little noises with his voice, and we would be kind of mimicking that with the same or vice versa. And it was just it was just brilliant. And we'd just be co-going co-going around the garden at the studio um, with enthusiasm, which is kind of kind of hear that energy even though it's quite a sort of deep track we just have a vibe he goes into with different people into studios and they sound totally different don't they, they it's you know it's like he's got a, he adds his flavor to everything and 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 uh, he has a he had a, an amazing talent for that and enthusiasm that 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 yeah, you know it's such a shame he lost that really it's such a shame. He, he you know, he, he should still be around and, and be uh, be be inspiring people him again. But but there we go. He yeah. He has to have this 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 locker. This this sort of bit above uh, the decks behind in tag right at the top. And I used to keep my stuff in there, my records, which I would put aside. And your dad knew this, so he would come in and just stare up like a sort of a uh, like a hungry puppy going. And he just pointed at them, and I go, oh, for God's sake. And of course, because he was playing out, um, obviously way more than I was, I, I couldn't not let him have them. So of course, so I'd get out these hot TPs that I've been given, and, and of course, give them to him because that's where they belonged. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't be precious about stuff like that. And then it, what was great was, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, he'd come in on a Friday and there'd be a wiggle on Saturday and I'd give him some test pressing and then he'd literally play it out that, you know, the following day. And he there might be one of ten in the whole of Britain or something. And then you'd just hear this track and he'd play it a wiggle and it was just like one of my, my yeah, memorable moments was giving him a copy of the um, Moonraker by the foremost poet. I gave it to him, the first thing I gave him, of course he listened to it and dropped it a wiggle on literally the following day. But it was just one of those moments when he played it and he only sat with it and it was just amazing. And while many of you have been made too brainwashed to comprehend, this frequency is and has become a threat to our society as we know it. This frequency has been used by a secret society in conjunction with... Everybody just didn't know what was going on because it's such a mad track and nobody would heard it before. And it just is one of those seminal moments I'll never forget. He had it definitely had his own sound. And you knew when he was you knew without looking, you knew when he when he'd come on. You know, within two tracks you you'd know it was Nathan. So that's quite that's quite unique. Quite unique. Sometimes he has a kind of humorous edge to the music and I mean you can see that in some of the titles of the um, tracks he put out as well there was a, a bit of a humorous side to it and I remember um, Nathan always played he, he was a big fan of acid he used to play lots of acid in his sets but he's yeah his sets were just fantastic you know I really loved them always really groovy well put together well mixed he was always dancing he was like always just look, look like he was just having a great time but then at some point he'd just sort of zone in to the mix uh, but he'd be kind of like looking around somehow had this amazing telepathic ability to just keep track of every single person in the room no matter how many people they were and um, you know just try and figure out if someone wasn't dancing like you just figure out how to make them dance it didn't matter if he had to go onto the actual dance floor to make them dance he, he would go out out there and make them dance on the dance floor she came out the booth and he started like he's he was like had the whole crew for the whole crowd and then he sort of rem he sort of remembered just in time that he had to put the next record on and he, <laughs> he went frantically ran back into the booth to like put it on again but that was you know that's the nature of the beast you know that's that's nathan all over wasn't it you know he loved the music so much he, he didn't want to be the star of the show he wanted to be with the crowd you know so he came out the booth and he's like oh, come on, let's have it and he's like oh shit and he run back in and put the other record on you know 
then we went to this place called Kit Kat. Uh, and we played there as well. We played at the Kit Kat Club. Uh, but yeah, the things we had to take our tops off because everybody in there was topless sort of thing, yeah? So it was one of those parties, yeah? So he was like, yeah, come on then, do you know, on the, on, on the actual, on the tables and everything like that. But a great one about Nathan, when he, wasn't he on a flight in somewhere in Eastern Europe? And the pilot uh, knew who he was and he was like a Nathan fan and he got him up into the cockpit. Sat in the, sat in the, uh, in the uh, in the co-pilot seat. Oh yeah, Nathan Cole's famous DJ. I love your music, you know. And they sat in spliff and, 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 and smoked a spliff, <laughs> flying on the way back. I, I, I still just think I still think could that really have bloody happened? But knowing your knowing Nathan, knowing your dad, anything like that was possible. If you were in his company, he'd go out of his way to make you feel relaxed and uh, had this really kind of funny kind of quick witted side to him and uh, which made you feel at, really at ease. He wanted to make people comfortable, he wanted to make people laugh, he wanted to make people happy you know that's the most important part of the whole thing of his life it was that happiness. It was the energy he brought energy, to the yeah. party first and foremost and it was infectious and it was it knocked down the walls of inhibition and no one would dare mess with that energy in, in a room, you know. And, even, and, and I've seen lots of situations where he's taken on these characters that are really serious and quite often off, off, off their heads, but angry. And he's managed to just front it out, but and not, it not end with violence. It end up from talking these people down. Lots of different characters just end up, you know, either laughing or crying or dancing. you know but, or dancing you would like massage all your sort of anxiety away you know and just make people feel relaxed and you know good about themselves and good about being here and you just you know it was always a pleasure to be with them you know, he was, uh, uh, and not you know not for not for the sake of doing it. he wouldn't just do that with anyone but he would do that to the people he, he liked uh, he would also be very honest with people if, if he wasn't too sure and he would you know hit the nail on the head with people always yeah if you were feeling a bit down or insecure or weren't quite sure whether you were going to actually have a good night or not he'd, he'd, he'd soon work out what that was and, and break down those walls of inhibition and you'd end up then going on the vendor for a few days um, without a care in the world and just you know, I think I think it's like it, he's a people person and party star first. Before you've got to put that at the top of the pile with him. Mm. And he like, really did. He really could. I mean, he could really just bring. And I'd and I'd once became good friends. I'd be like, "What? Why are you knocking around with that dickhead and stuff like that?" And. He could always see the good in people, and he'd also, I couldn't even remember people's names, and he'd remember what their kids' names were, and what the story from last time he saw people, even when we were all off our heads. In a funny sort of way, that's the best legacy. You know, you can talk about the music, you can talk about the parties, you can talk about, you know, it, um, you know the fact that he was a, contributed to a, 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 a brand new subgenre of dance music which is now seen you, you hear it played in massive clubs you know and he was one of the, he was one of the original founding fathers of that you know so you can say all of that but but in a funny sort of way you know his legacy is 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 is, is the people that uh, around him you know the people that, you know and, and how and how you know he you know, you know what, what he, you know what he's given the given the world. He, he just loved people. He so loved people, and 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 people loved him. And it's it's a shame that that he couldn't see that. It's one of the prices you pay when you give so much of yourself to other people. You know, you, there's not a lot of room left for you know you, you, your own self. You know, he always thought more for other people about other people probably than he did himself. And that's, and, and yeah, you know, that's a testament to his, his, his love for humanity and, 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 and family and friends and he'd do anything for anyone and, and, but yeah.
Look, I've always said it. There, there, there wasn't a bad bone in his body, man. There really wasn't a bad bone in his body. Every, he loved everyone and um, thought the best of everyone. And it was, it, you know, he was, he was just a real and lovely character. You know. I think pe people need to know about about this guy for posterity. You know, and it's not just people like myself who who you know knew knew him relatively well. You know, it's it's for for people who didn't know him because you know. You know, it's there was a starting point to all this, and the starting point to the entire scene, the community was him.